Hello everyone, welcome to the second video of the 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons class guide series. This time we will cover the wizard class. Spell casting is not a simple affair, the rules is lengthy, but once you get your head around it, it's a piece of cake. Proceeding onward, I would assume that you are somewhat familiar with the rules of spell casting. If you're not, or need a refresher on the rules, then you can catch the class feature and spell casting video from the Learn How to Play Dungeons & Dragons 5e series. But if you're caught up, let's begin with the class guide. In D&D 5e, there are 6 dedicated spellcasting classes, including the wizard. But each of them is unique. Thematically, wizards are the scholars of the spellcasting classes. They gain their magical prowess through study and experimentation. Wizards are inseparable to their spellbooks, which contains years and even centuries of their research into the arts and sciences of magic. Trying to separate a wizard from her spellbook can often be the greatest mistake some fools could ever commit. But remember, in D&D not all spells are for exploding low intellect miscreants. There are 8 schools of spells that cover all aspects of adventuring from combat to social interaction. And the 8 schools of spells are Abjuration for protective spells Conjuration for transporting an object or creature from one location to another Divination to locate objects or foretell the future Enchantment to affect the minds of others Evocation to produce bursts of energy like fire or coal Illusion to deceive the senses and the minds of others Necromancy to manipulate life and death And finally, Transmutation The transformation of a creature, object or environment's properties just as fighters have archetypes, the wizards have arcane tradition, which are related to the school of spells they specialize in. It separates a wizard from another, but specializing in one tradition doesn't stop the wizard from learning spells from other schools. It only makes copying new spells of the schools they specialize in less costly. It also gives the wizard some unique features that are relevant to the schools of spells related to their arcane tradition. Wizards with their massive collection of spells are incredibly useful to have in a party. But don't judge a wizard by their spellbook cover. Depending on the spells they have in their spellbook, they can be widely different kinds of wizards. Supporter, striker, utility, and so on. Since combat is a significant part of D&D, a wizard is usually expected to pick some spells that let them contribute in combat situations. If not by support spells that buff party members or debuff enemies, then by spells that hurt enemies. A lot. Areas of effect spells that affects multiple targets are great to have because most martial classes are unable to hit multiple enemies at once, and it's great for wiping out mobs of weaker enemies. But despite their amazing powers, they are one of the most physically frail classes out there. You wouldn't want them to take hits at all if you can help it. Let's move on to the level breakdown and I will show you why. A wizard's hit dice is 1d6, the smallest hit dice size among all the classes. Only the sorcerer's hit dice is as small. Without any modifier bonus or penalties, they start with 6 hit points, and gain the average of 4 hit points per level. They are not proficient with any kind of armors either, so they will have to bolster their armor class with abjuration spells like mage armor and shield. With low hit points and armor class, it's never a good idea to place wizards anywhere near danger. They are proficient with specific weapons, but the selection isn't really great. They have saving throw proficiencies in intelligence and wisdom, so they have better chance of resisting effects that erases memory or control minds. The skills available to them are mainly knowledge skills, so remember to ask the dungeon master a lot of questions to put them to good use. At level 1, the wizard has the spellcasting feature. Yay, what a surprise! But the rules of spellcasting is unique to every spellcasting class, so let's have a closer look at the wizard's rules. They use intelligence as their spellcasting ability, and they can gain up to 9th level spell slot. The most important part of the spellcasting feature is their spellbook. They can copy spells into it and cast ritual spells with it, but every spell they can ever learn still has to come from the wizard spell list. Before we go further, let's quickly revise the difference between class level, spell slot level, and spell level. Class level is your player character's level in that class. Spell slot level is your spellcasting resource used to cast a certain spell. Spell level is the power level of the spell. You need to have the spell slot of the corresponding level or higher to be able to cast it. Before you worry about running out of spells too early, wizards at level 1 can pick 3 different kinds of cantrips. Cantrips are weaker spells that you can use at any time without expending any spell slot. 
they will learn more cantrips as they reach certain levels. They also learn 6 first level spells that goes into their spell book. Every time they level up, they can add 2 more spells from the wizard spell list into their spell book. And those spells has to be in the spell level they have wizard spell slots for or below. Basically, you need to be able to cast it as a wizard to learn it. But just having the spell in the spell book and spell slot for it is not enough to cast a spell. They also need to have the spells prepared by memorizing and practicing them. The number of spells they can prepare is their level plus intelligence modifier, and it can be of any combination of the spells they have in their spell book. They can change the list of their prepared spells after finishing a long rest by spending 1 minute per spell level for each spell on their new list. So for example, even if you have just changed your list by one spell, you have to prepare for all of them. Later on, when they can prepare more spells of higher level, they can take a really long time to get ready in the morning. Their spellbook mechanic is what sets them apart from other spellcasting class. Wizards can copy wizard spells they find in spell scrolls or other spellbooks into their own. To do so, they need to have the spell slot to cast a spell and they must spend 2 hours and 50 gold for every level of the spell copied. A level 5 spell for example, take 10 hours and 250 gold to copy into your own. With all the gold and time involved in spell research, you can easily imagine how precious a wizard spellbook is. If they lose it, or worse, if their spellbook is destroyed, then everything they have written is gone forever. They will only have the spells they have prepared and memorized. Once they get a new spellbook, they can rewrite only the spells they have prepared into the new spellbook at the rate of 1 hour and 10 gold per spell level for each spell. That's why a lot of wizards keep a backup copy of their spellbook. Transcribing spells from their own spellbook to a copy also comes at a reduced cost of 1 hour and 10 gold for every spell level for each spell. That's because it's easier for the wizard to understand and read their own handwriting. With their spellbooks, they can cast ritual spells without having to prepare it. Without the spellbook, they will need to have the spells prepared. The spellcasting focus they use are the arcane focus, and you can find them in the equipment chapter of the player's handbook. The wizard has a steep learning curve. As you can see, we haven't even gone past level 1. But once you get your head around the spellbook mechanic, everything else is a breeze. At level 1, they also get the arcane recovery feature. Once a day, when taking a short rest, they can recover up to half their wizard's level's worth of combined spell slots rounded up. But they cannot recover spell slots that's level 6 or higher. So for example, at level 11, they have 6 points of recovery and they can split it between 3 level 2 spell slots, level 5 and 1 spell slots, or 2 and 4 spell slots. At level 2, they choose their arcane tradition, or school of spell specialization. For this video, I will choose Evocation. Doing so gives the wizard Evocation Savant and Sculpt Spells features. The Evocation Savant spend half the gold and time to copy Evocation spells into their spellbook. Sculpt Spells allows them to choose one plus spell level number of creatures to succeed on the saving throw of the wizard's Evocation spell and take no damage. It's pretty useful if you have allies in the fray. At level 3, wizards get their second level spell slot, so they can cast level 2 spells like Shatter. Wizards don't get too many class features, but they have tons of spells to choose from, so the lack of unique class features is actually really good for them, because it doesn't distract them from what they do best, which is casting spells. At level 4, they get their first ability score improvement, and another cantrip for a total of 4. At level 5, their cantrip powers up, dealing double the number of hit dice. The Firebolt, for example, now does 2d10 of fire damage. Additionally, they get spell level 3 spells, like Lightning Bolt. At level 6, School of Evocation Wizards get the potent cantrip feature. If the wizard's cantrip forces the enemy to make a saving throw, it still deals them half the damage even if they succeeded on the saving throw. At level 7, they get their 4th level spell slot, and they can cast spells like Greater Invisibility. At level 8, they get their 2nd ability score improvement. Level 9, 5th level spell slot, they can cast spells like Cloud Kill. Level 10, they get another cantrip and school of evocation feature. They can add their intelligence modifier to any wizard evocation spell they cast. Of course, that includes evocation cantrips. At level 11, their cantrips become more powerful again, and they can do triple the damage dice. They also gain 6 level spell slot, and they can cast the spell Flash to Stone. At level 12, third ability score improvement. 13, they get their first level 7 spell slot and they can cast spells like Teleport. At level 14, the School of Evocation Wizards get their Arcane Tradition feature. 
over the channel. When you cast a wizard spell of level 5 or below, you can deal maximum damage with that spell. So a level 3 fireball, for example, does the maximum of 8d6 or 48 points of fire damage. But the second time you use this feature before a long rest, you take 2d12 of necrotic damage per spell level of the cast spell. The third time you use it, it becomes 3d12 per level of the spell and so on. The necrotic damage you take ignores your resistance and immunity. At level 15, they get their 8th level spell slot, and they can cast the spell Sunburst. At level 16, 4th ability score improvement. At 17, they reach the epic tier. Their cantrip does quadruple the damage, and they get their 9th level spell slot. They can literally stop time now by casting Time Stop. At level 18, they get the Spell Mastery feature. They can choose a 1st level and a 2nd level wizard spell in their spellbook, and cast them at the lowest level without expanding a spell slot, if they have those spells prepared. They can replace the spells for spells of the same level by spending 8 hours of study. At level 19, 5th and last ability score improvement. Finally, at the maximum level of 20, they get their signature spells. They can choose 2 3rd level spells in their spellbook like Fireball and Lightning, and cast each of them once at their lowest level without having to expand spell slot. These spells are always prepared and they don't count against the number of spells they can prepare. So there you go, 20 levels of wizard. Generally, all wizards have the same function, which is casting spells. But the few additional features provided by the arcane tradition can really give them a whole different dimension. School of Abjuration wizards, for example, can even be a side defender with their arcane ward feature. Conjuration has some utility features and it strengthens summon creatures in later levels. Divination is mostly utility with some wacky juju features. Enchantment gives the wizard some mind-controlling features that aid in social interaction. Evocation is great if you like blasting things and doing massive damage. Illusion gives you mostly utility features and other life-saving tricks. Necromancy lets the wizard become an undead lord. Transmutation School has a lot of support and utility features. They can even do some healing and raise that at later levels. The funny thing about wizard multiclassing is that they don't mix well with other spellcasting classes. Though spell slots are universally used, wizard spellcasting power comes from their intelligence, while other spellcasting classes use their wisdom and charisma. They have to use different abilities to cast spells from different classes, and that's usually not optimal. On the other hand, they multiclass pretty well with fighters and rogues, because those two have spellcasting archetypes that use intelligence as power source, and use the wizard spell list too. But it usually happens the other way around. Eldritch Knight fighters and trickster rogues usually dip a few levels into the wizard class so that they can get more spell slots and spell variety. The wizard is definitely one of the more complex classes to learn. Don't be fooled by the lack of class features, because each spell can be equally complex if not more. Picking the spell to learn and prepare can also be a bit of a struggle. But in general, pay attention to the narrative and prepare for spells you think you may need at your destination. Also, don't forget to prepare some combat spells too. You need to be able to protect your precious spellbook after all. Anyway, thanks for watching the DND 5e Wizard Class Guide. If there is anything here that you don't understand, you can rewatch the Learn How to Play DND 5e series or ask in the comment section. If you like this video, subscribe to the channel and press the bell button for more videos like this. Before signing off, I would like to thank my patrons at Patreon for helping to make this series possible. If you like my work and would like to help the channel, please consider becoming a patron. CJ, over and out.